Okay, so we're reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 23. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what is this new teaching that you're presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we'd like to know what they'd mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Okay. Um, one of the disadvantages of being a Scottish Presbyterian is uh, short talks are almost impossible. <laughs> That's no, but um, I knew a lawyer who could speak for two hours, and that was just his first point. So I'm sure you'll all be at home. No, we will. We'll keep it, and hopefully we'll have questions. Um, I find it fascinating. Just I like watching and observing wherever I go. And I found it fascinating on the news here in Melbourne this morning that the police have just arrested a couple of guys for um, Islamist terrorism. Basically, they were planning an attack. And I found it fascinating. The first thing that the police spokesperson said is that we are arresting them for the crime ideology. And I thought, wow, there's some sensitive things here. Uh, it just seemed an unusual thing to say. And, and I, I don't know... Uh, is religion a protected category uh, in terms of law here? Because it certainly is now in the UK, um, which I'm not over sure of a good idea. Religion, we're, we're talking about something that is pretty, um, in one sense, hard to define, and also what people mean when laws protect religion. What are they protecting? And what we're looking at today is, and it was in effect a religious court. But let's just say something about re religion. I'm thinking of it here from the perspective of those who maybe consider themselves religious. Those, is that? Yeah, okay, good. Those who may not consider themselves religious. Um, those who don't like the use of the term religion. So, for example, if I was asked to fill out a form, I'd be very inclined to put non-religious, although that I'm a Christian. Um, it's interesting, at the period that we look, within a very short period of time, the Christians were described by the Greeks as atheists. So all the Christians would have been known as atheists because they didn't have temples, they didn't have clergy as such, and they were just deemed to be atheists. So what we mean by religion can be very uh, difficult and what religion is real and what religion is true. And one of the big questions for a lot of people is if there are so many religions, why should one of them be right? Um, and I, again, I struggle with that reasoning, but I can understand it to some degree. There are an estimated 4,200 different religions in the world, and they're usually categorized into the several main ones, uh, Christianity, which is uh, around 2.5 billion. Some people think it's nearly 3 billion. Uh, Islam, uh, about 2 billion. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism. Uh, there are other smaller religions such as Baha'i. There are what are termed traditional religions. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting when you go back into the roots of, of them all in virtually every culture, including indigenous culture in Australia, there is a, a, a concept of uh, one creator God. Uh, in, in 
Chinese philosophy before Confucianism. That's the same. And I think the atheist or the Richard Dawkins understanding of religion is that human beings, you know, we evolved, we began to look up at the sun, we thought, hey, a nice, bright, shiny thing. Uh, obviously, human beings were not in Scotland at that point. Uh, and they were saying, well, we, we, we must worship that. How we knew what worship is, Dawkins doesn't say. But so we worshipped everything. We had, we were polytheists. We had gods for everything. And then later on with the Jews, the Zoroastrians, the Persians, Christians and Muslims, we became monotheists. And now in the 21st century, we've advanced so far as we can do without God altogether. The only problem with that is historically, I don't think it works because historically, I think the evidence is that we moved from being monotheists to being polytheists and then all over the place after that. I thought I would do some research before I came here and look at what the religion of Melbourne was because you have a reputation of being a godless place. Uh, you know, this is a, a, for me, it's a very European city in some ways. I, I speak to Christians here who feel a little bit under siege. Uh, you're not as godless as sometimes it's made out. I suspect uh, your elites are pretty godless, but even then. So uh, in the 2011 census, which is the latest figures I could get, obviously there's gonna be one this year, 55.8% of respondents said they were Christians. And this intrigued me, but also I was quite surprised at it. Majority Catholic, 27.2% of the population would profess to be Catholic. And I think a lot of that has to do where people originally came from. The vast majority of Melbourne is uh, still predominantly European. Um, a little bit less British than other parts of Australia, but I think that's where the Catholic aspect, the Irish and other things come in as well. 22.7% Protestant and around 6% Orthodox. And if this is still true, I don't know, but Melbourne being the third largest Greek city in the world, that's where a huge amount of that comes from. I remember the first time I came here, it was interesting on the bus to hear announcements in English, Mandarin, and Greek. So I thought, yeah, this must be Melbourne. Um, but it's, it's interesting that you will still find, especially in either non-white or in particular non-Anglos, you will find a considerable amount of respect for religion. The non-religious figure, it depends what you mean by that. When, when you know, 84% of statistics are just made up. Um, when, you, when you look at the statistics and how it works out, it depends what you mean by non-religious. I'd be very wary of that. In terms of card-carrying atheists, even in Melbourne, um, it, it's a very small percentage of the general population which I find intriguing. You, you find an increasing amount of people who profess to be spiritual, but not religious. So, I mean, I describe myself as Christian, but not religious. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way of looking at things. Derek Thomas says this uh, about Athens, talking about Paul. How do we react to living in a city that's dominated by non-Christian ideology and religion? Aesthetically beautiful, culturally sophisticated, but morally decadent and spiritually dead. Uh, that pretty well describes to me Sydney. Uh, it absolutely describes Edinburgh. Um, I, if it describes Melbourne, I will leave that up to you guys to tell me afterwards. Um, you know, I mean, what is there in Melbourne? Well, I, I know for me, the center of Melbourne is the MCG, uh, which I'm still determined to come to before they send me back out of into exile in Scotland. Um, there's the Yarra. I mean, what's what, what? What would you if what would the highlights of Melbourne be. Anyone here tell me, by the way, the most beautiful parts of Melbourne? Botanical gardens? The MCG. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I, I mean, I love the wide streets. I just think that's, it's, uh, for me, it's, it was fascinating even just walking the wee bit that we walked this morning. So, you know, there's a lot there. There's culturally, there's meant to be a lot in Melbourne um, as well. Uh, although, Sydney siders deny this, but <laughs> I think, you know, there is, there's a huge amount. And yet I would argue that as with most of our cities, I, I wonder what's missing. It's like Athens was a center of politics, a center of religion, center of culture and philosophy. You could say that Athens at this time is arguably the birthplace of Western democracy, music, ethics, theater, and medicine. Uh, but it only had 12,000 people. 
because people were leaving and going to Sydney. Sorry, I mean, going to Corinth. They were just getting out. And Paul went there. It was the, used to be the major city, but it was still an enormous center for that. Um, I've been to Athens and I stood on the spot where Paul made this speech. And it's really quite astonishing, not least because you realize that he's standing with the, the, in front of the Parthenon, which is absolutely massive. And he's saying to the people who were this uh, prime value people of the time that you know, they'd invested billions in building this monument to the gods. And Paul stands there and says, you just wasted your money, guys, because God doesn't live there. Uh, I mean, it was just an incredibly brave thing to say and incredibly radical. And, you know, I, I find I, I just I just found it utterly amazing that this guy called Paul goes into this place and he talks to them and he gets taken before a court, really. He's on a holiday, I think. Well, maybe not on holiday, but he's on a tour around Greece, if you like. I think he was sent to Athens for a bit of a break. And he, go, he goes to the synagogue, he goes to the marketplace. He ends up causing a bit of a dispute and he gets taken before the courts because that's what the Areopagus was. It was a court that adjudicated in religious matters. Two main groups in it, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Very important to understand this as well, because we live in a society which is, how will I put it, chronologically snob snobbish. We assume that because we live in the 21st century, we're more intelligent, more advanced, more progressed than other parts. No, no, no. There's nothing new under the sun. So when I tell you about the Epicureans and the Stoics, you'll recognize this because we have Epicureans here uh, today. The Epicureans were based on the atomic physics of Democrates, 341 to 270 BC. The discovery of the atom is not something that's 20th century. They were materialists and they believed in chance and pleasure. So basically, uh, I don't know what the Melbourne term would be, but in Sydney, I would call them North Shore materialists. They're the kind of people who would have angst about whether they buy their second Porsche or not, you know. And they basically just go, well, I'm here, I'm, I'm in this position, I, because I've worked hard, or often just the way, thick, way the cards have fallen. You know, that's just the way it is. It, uh, it's a materialistic, hedonistic view of life. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. The Stoics, uh, Zeno, I love that. Zeno, Zeno could be, I don't know, like a, a wrestling guy or something. But Zeno, 340 to 265 BC, uh, argues that there's reason within the universe. The world is divine, but it's very fatalistic. It's que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. What the fates have got for you will not go by you. Um, Stoics tended to be defenders of tradition as well. And um, Paul comes and he, he deals with this. Now, he's, it's a very serious challenge that he's got because he's being charged with something. You, you'll have all heard of Socrates. Well, Socrates was before this court, and he was charged with advocating foreign gods, the same as Paul. And I think, well, I'll tell you what happened to Socrates if you don't know, that he was executed by being forced to drink a cup of hemlock for advocating foreign gods. So this wasn't a trivial matter. That I, I realize your lawyers, I don't know if any of you are criminal lawyers, you're not going to be advocating that uh, when you're prosecuting that someone be given a cup of poison to uh, otherwise known as Sydney coffee uh, for, <laughs> for committing that crime. You shall be sentenced to drink Sydney coffee for the rest of your life. Um, for those of you watching from Sydney, I'm only joking. It's okay. Newtown's still the best. Um, they, they get very upset at that kind of thing. They, they misunderstood Paul, and that often happens with religion as well. So they thought he was advocating two gods, a man called Jesus and a goddess called Anastasias, the resurrection. Uh, next week, I'm going to look at the, the resurrection side of it. But also, it's incredibly deep. This court case goes really deep. We only have a very narrow reporting of it. This is not, the, if you like, the court reporter's version. This is a very short summary of what probably took a day to, to work out. I like what John Stott says, by the way, in terms of... Uh, the reaction that people have to Christianity today. He says, many people are rejecting our gospel today, not because they perceive it to be false, but because they see it, perceive it to be trivial. And I would say to those who are Christians that far too often we present the Bible in a very trivial way. 
I've uh, just watched the most extraordinary interview with Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Agnew. And Jonathan Agnew is Eastern Orthodox. And it's one of the most incredibly moving things. It's an hour, Peterson never does short. So it's an hour and 30 minutes. And Peterson is agonizing why he doesn't believe. And he says he does believe. But he says, one of the things he says is, one of the things I just do not get, how come you guys can't present this story? He said, I present it. And Agnew said, yeah, you're right. Lots of people have become Christians because of you. And uh, Peterson goes, well, why didn't, you know, how do I find it so hard to believe? I'm terrified. But then he said, I look at so many in the church and he basically says, you don't live. What you said, this is a, this is a great story. And you, you guys he said, how can I be expected to believe it if you don't live it? I, I just went, oh, well, he was so right. He was so right. And I think there's a trivialness. Now you can never accuse Paul of being trivial. Um, if I had time, and I don't, uh, there are 10 things in the passage which Paul uses to point towards uh, Jesus. But the one I do want to mention is where we began and where I'm going to finish in a couple of minutes, and it's religion. Um, why is there religion at all? I'm a historian. That's my training. And it really intrigues me. I cannot think of any single society in human history ever which has not been religious. Now, that is a phenomenal thing. Uh, and it's very interesting that since, inverted commas, the Enlightenment, when human beings have tried to do without religion, it's never worked. In fact, this may come as a shock to a lot of people, particularly, again, in Western wealthy cities like uh, Melbourne. But it's predicted that by 2050, the number of non-religious people in the world will have shrunk. And the number of religious people will have increased. And that's not just the growth of Islam. It's because of the decline of the growth of Christianity in places like China. And also the fact that secularism is now perceived to have failed in, in Europe. So, I mean, and also the growth of the church in, in Africa. So why, why do human beings have that? Now, I thought what... What was really interesting for me when I look at this in terms of Paul is he doesn't attempt to prove God. He just thinks, what's, what's, I think, what's the point of that? He begins with God and he says, we tell you about Christ. And, you know, I found it really amazing. I remember one lady coming to church who'd never, ever been. And she said she would come and try it for six weeks, to be fair. She said to her neighbor, I'm going to try it for six weeks. And the, and the neighbor warned her, watch out. Like they really believe the Bible, they're weird, and you know they'll eat your children. I mean, just everything. And they, um, she went back to her friend afterwards and said, "No, forget six weeks." And, and her friend said, "Yeah, I told you that. You wouldn't. I knew you wouldn't last." He said, "No, no, I'm going for life. This is it. This is what I've been looking for all my life." There was a sense. Of, now you can't blame indoctrination or anything because she'd been indoctrinated, if you like it, the other way. And incidentally, that's a, that's, a, that's a really fascinating thing, how much people are indoctrinated the other way. So uh, I remember I used to be a pastor in a church in Scotland. A lot of young people came, a lot of students. One day I'm standing at the door uh, as people are leaving, and this couple come up and I say, hi, nice to have you with us. Are you visiting? They said, yeah, kind of. Um, we've got, um, are you standing for a reason? So I've got one minute. Is that correct? One minute. So I'll finish this story later. And they said, yeah, 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 we're, we've, uh, we've just visiting our daughter. I said, oh, your daughter? And who said that girl there? I said, oh, first year. I said, this is the third week. It's unusual for parents to come the third week. What's, uh, what's the deal? Something wrong? They said, oh, yes, yeah, there's something wrong. I said, oh, can I help? They said, no, you're the problem. And I thought, what did I do? Did I, in a, was I inappropriate? Did I say something? You know, did I hug her when I, you know, I said, what? Well, Oh, we, I said, no, you have to tell me now. I'm sorry. And they said, okay, we brought up our daughter to be normal. You know, we expected her to go down to university, have what we call Freshers Week, have a few parties, drink and all the rest of it. But, um, and then get on with her work and be happy. And we start getting these letters home and they're saying things like, mom, dad, I love Dundee. It's a great city. I've started going to this church. It's brilliant. I said, oh, so you brought her up to be normal. You mean you brought her up not to go to church? And they said, Absolutely. I said, so you've come down to check us out? And they said, yes. I said, how did you find it? And they went, you were surprisingly normal. <laughs> and I wish at that point I'd stopped. <laughs> but 
But instead, I went, well, you caught us on a good day. <laughs> Next week, we do the child sacrifice. And they were, oh, for a nanosecond. And I said, you're kidding me. Seriously, guys, is that what you think? But there is almost that kind of prejudice. And I've got, you know, a thousand and one more stories like that. But Peter Rinch will throw me out the window if, if that happens. So people are anti-religious. And yet deep within, there's this strong religious instinct. Religion can be good and religion can be bad. And how we work it out, I think we have to work it out. We have to work out its good use and its bad use. It's a bit like, how will I put it this way? It's like sex and money. You know, money can be bad. Sex can be misused. I doubt there's a single person here who's saying, right, no more money, no more sex. Let's ban them both. Uh, it is Victoria, so who knows? But <laughs> um, so why do we do that with religion? I would argue that what we need is, there's, there's religion. What we need is good religion, not bad religion. The Bible defines what good religion is, and I think we can work on it. Well, uh, David, you can just take a seat and, and grab a, um, uh, have a bit of a drink and uh, take I'm your breath for a moment. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I heard that was a good Melbourne habit as well. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is where it's over to you uh, and over to your on Zoom, you get a chance to send in your questions. I've had some fantastic questions come through already. So that's why I had to stop, David, because I thought we've got to get to these questions. So uh, if, you, if, you've got a, if you've got a question, you just text it to the number on the front of the sheet there, or that's um, the, ba the base to the chat. Um, send your questions in, or you, or you want to write one on a piece of paper and send it up the front. If you're here in person, that's fine as well. Uh, and um, are you, you ready, David? Yeah. Because we're gonna we're gonna get going. There's um there's one from uh, Barris's Chambers up in Sydney. Eight Selborne. There's a group there. Uh, this is the question: Can one be an Epicurean or a Stoic Christian? Um, no. We swap it over, are we? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, because the the Epicureans. The point of the Epicureans was without Christ, basically without God, yeah. and the Stoics as well. They would have religion as a kind of um, traditional thing but religion in the bad old sense of as a means of control. So that's why the Christians were called atheists by both the Epicureans and the Stoics, yeah. because they didn't buy into their value system. So, so did, was it Polycarp who said uh, a way down with the atheists when he was being persecuted? Yeah, I know that uh, the, yeah. uh, the interesting thing about you know, how the Christians were perceived in, in that society is, I mean, there's actually a legal thing to this and a political thing. So um, not that this would happen, but imagine if Dan Andrews was worshipped here and considered as a god. And I hope this is not committing blasphemy, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and, uh, and, and he wanted political control. This is what the Romans did with Caesar. They you would say he wanted political control. Yeah, <laughs> absolute political control, you know, so no things like lawyers to muck things up. Um, what you would do is very simply this. What the Romans did was this. They, they conquered all the, the countries and grouped peoples around, and they said, fine, keep your gods. That's fine. You worship whatever god you want, but you have to accept that Caesar is God. And it's a bit like saying Mr. Andrews saying you have to accept that I'm God. You have whatever god you want, but you have to accept that I'm God. Big advantage that Mr. Andrews would have is he's actually here. And, you know, so he can give instructions, and you have to obey them because the, the instructions of a god. And what the Christians did was say, no, there's only one god. And it was actually a fundamentally revolutionary act because it prevented, uh, religion was used as a means of social control. Once you said that God was the creator and outside the system as well, then all of a sudden you lost that means of control. And it was a very, religion is a very powerful way to control people. It's why religious abuse is genuine because you can use religion to abuse people. So I, yes. I'm um, sorry. Anyway, that was one of the questions. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, it's a it's a question that refers to an earlier comment about the elites, perhaps yeah. the elites in Melbourne or elsewhere. Um, why do you think that atheists or non-religious people are more prominent amongst the elites rather than the rest of the population? Is it because the rest of us are religious people are less ambitious? And it's because we're thicker as well, you know. <laughs> um, no, I, I, look, there are a lot of elite people who do become who are who are religious and Christians, or people who just use it. If by the time of the fifth century you were in Rome, you were a Roman elite, you would announce yourself as a Christian, or you just wouldn't you wouldn't get on in society. So you know, it, it can work that way as well. I think the main reason is this: that if you've got a fair amount of money and a fair amount of power 
the I, uh, you tend to be quite autonomous, and the idea that you submit to God is not very attractive to you. Um, if you're poor, you've got less to lose, almost, you know, because you, you could argue that having faith is a bit of a gamble. Um, but if you're, if you're wealthier, you tend to think you're in control and you're in charge of things and you can fix things, you know. So is that, is that why the, the virus has been a, a shock to so many? Well, the, the virus, yes, because the idea that we can control and fix things. I mean, people, that's why you also get deep cynicism amongst people, because some people do believe that. Well, I remember when Tony Blair became prime minister in Britain, the theme song was things can only get better. Well, they didn't. You know, people become very cynical. Um, so, yeah, it, it's all to do with issues of control and of power. And also, I think, separation of powers. That's another thing. Um, if you take religion out of the equation, you tend to end up with the state as being God. Now, in uh, two weeks, on the 1st of April, you're going to be traveling to Canberra. You're going to be speaking there. And that you've just touched upon a bit of a theme. You're going to be talking uh, reflections on the future of Australia, uh, Paradise Lost. Um, what you know? What's what are you going to be talking about? Because that might be interesting for some people. Well, part of it is. I mean, I'm not. I'm never going to say Australia was paradise. I mean, there's one many wonderful things about Australia. Um, but life is always complex when you study history. And I think again, if you you know you guys with law, I mean, there are not many cases that are absolutely simple. You know, life is always complex. Let's take a divorce. You know, it's 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 always pretty complex. Um, and I think his, history is quite complex, but at a simplistic level, I would say that um, modern Australia developed largely on Christian principles. And as modern Australia moves away from those Christian principles, I'm not convinced that what it's going to be replaced with will be any better. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty certain it will be a lot worse. Um, so, so is that your comment about a move to a more totalitarian sort of... Well, it, it, totalitarian in some way or other, because you... Um, in, in Scotland, we had this thing where the king was, what they said, um, Rex Lex, the king is the law. And the Scottish reformers argued, no, no, the law is the king. And even the king was subject to the law. Uh, I think we are probably moving towards a more authoritarian type of state, purely and simply because we don't recognize very much the separation of powers. Okay. So but anyway, that's a separate. So, so, that, so that's in two weeks' time. Okay. Um, just before I move to another question here, is there any questions from the floor? Uh, question without notice. Feel free or comment. That was someone. Yes. Victoria and Scotland seem to be fairly similar in their repressive legislation against yeah. Christians. Yeah. Um, and I think Scotland might be ahead of us in a couple of, uh, couple of ways. How is the church reacting to um, a more active level of persecution? Yeah, I, I think I'd be careful how I'd use my language in that. I would say it's what, what happens is you get stages. So I think we're moving towards discrimination rather than persecution. But discrimination usually leads to persecution. So, for example, I would argue that if you discriminated against gay people, it, can, it usually would end up with, and I think it's, it's almost, um, the situation we've got in Scotland is worse than Victoria, but you, we, we're trying to stay ahead of you in the slide downwards, but you're catching up at some points as well. Um, we have a hate crime bill, which is utterly astounding, that when it's passed, it will criminalize what you say in your own home, which is breathtaking. So Alexa could take one of your comments and and what it criminalizes is hate based on the perception of the person who thinks <coughs> that they're being hateful now i've I, I did that with the scottish police i thought they were being hateful so i reported them to themselves they didn't take my report too seriously <laughs> you know there are certain privileged groups that are considered to be you know so i mean somebody said to me and a politician wrote me and said dave that means don't worry christianity is protected i said i don't want to be protected i want people to feel free to criticize me but I also want free to explore, you know, do my own beliefs. Um, the reaction of the church in Scotland has been absolutely pathetic. Absolutely. I cannot describe how pathetic it has been. Um, it's just said, we'll just go along with this. We'll go along with this in effect. And it won't matter because it will end. It never ends. It never ends. When, when people get into the habit of making laws seeking to control people, it's like inquiries. They never stop. You know, it's like in Australia just now, we've got this... I think rightly a big fuss about sexual abuse of, of women by people in power. 
it's not going to end when laws and inquiries, more laws are made and more inquiries are had. It won't end. It has more to do with human nature. But if you think you can control people in that way, then you tend to become much more authoritarian, much more repressive, much more controlling. You tend to trust people a lot less, uh, you know, and things like common sense or group solidarity and things like that. And also, it's virtually impossible to have a pluralistic society uh, with that. So the, ch the response of the church has been really bad. Um, I think now in Scotland, we live in Babylon, as they say, and that requires courage. It's too late to save Christendom. That's gone. I suspect in Melbourne, it's the same case, by the way. I think in Sydney, we still think, oh, it's okay, we can preserve some of the vestiges of Christendom, but I think we're wrong, you know? And I think in Melbourne, you, you, you can't even have that pretense now. Okay, uh, we've just got time for one last question. This is um, from a watch party in Sydney. Uh, will Christianity become stronger, purer, more real in Australia if it continues to become politically weaker uh, and there's more repressive legislation? No. That, um, I, I find that middle-class Christians in Western societies occasionally fantasize about being persecuted and say, wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, no, it's not. Uh, you know, it's like Constantine. People say, oh, wasn't it a terrible thing when Constantine was converted? Well, no, not if you were part of the church and you were being executed quite frequently and women were being raped and so on. And then the emperor becomes a Christian and stops all that. You tend to think this is quite a good idea. Um, I do think there's a little bit of or, or wouldn't this be good? We'd be much more pure and all that. Yeah, persecution does sort out the church. I just wouldn't long for it. It's a bit like I was um, seriously ill. It, it, in some ways, it was a blessing. I just wouldn't want it again, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone again. I mean, I would say, Lord, thank you for giving me this experience, but do you mind if I don't have it again? Because, <laughs> and I think the same with the. It, look. I think the church has to have a wider perspective than just thinking about the current situation in Australia. I think we need to think we have got a tremendous gospel, tremendous good news. I think that just as COVID and the bushfires have taught us a really rather sharp lesson, I think that one of the worst things that could happen to Australia is what the Bible predicts in Romans chapter one that would happen in Rome and did happen, that God would say, okay, you don't want me, you get your way. Let's see how you run it. Let's see how you do it. It might be a little bit like if you've got a child and your child, I remember my parents, I said, I don't want to stay at home. I can look after myself better. And my mom said, yeah, sure, go. There's your tent on you go. So I went and lived out in the back garden for about half a night. You know? <laughs> and then I realized maybe this wasn't such a good thing. And I think maybe what God will do in Australia is say, okay, that's fine. You want to go that route? My major concern with that is the people who that will hurt most. And I think it will hurt the poor the most. Um, and I'm not so bothered about persecution in the church uh, because at one level, to some degree, I think I've ex experienced it a little bit, this, the discrimination side. I I'm joking a little bit, but not. Uh, th this is actually a serious point, which is hard to get over to people. I would struggle to go back to Scotland because when the hate crime bill passes, I'm fairly certain I, I would end up being charged. Uh, and that I, I, I don't want to be a martyr, to be honest. I, I don't want to. So, you know, um, I, it, it's an interesting situation here. I, I think one of the biggest threats you face here, by the way, is the conversion therapy bill. And the reason for that is not as a defense of what, we, what some people perceive as conversion therapy, which, you know, coercive rape or anything like that, which is absolutely ridiculous and already, already illegal anyway. But it's the attempt to say that um, if someone came to me as this happened and said, can you pray with me because I'm really struggling with my sexual desires and I did, and they then went and reported me to the police, I, I, could, I would be breaking the law for praying. You know, that's really quite extraordinary with a consenting adult. You know, there's lots of other things I could do with a consenting adult, I wouldn't be breaking the law. But praying with someone who asked me to pray would actually be illegal or it could be illegal. Now, I think the way that law will be used, by the way, is not as, let's go around and lock up all the Christians. I think that's rather ridiculous. But it's a restraining thing. It's a threat. And the threat tends to make people think, especially organizations, churches, charities, and others say, okay, let's just tone this down a bit. Let's keep this. So uh, 
I, I think we need to be wary of that. I, there's a wrong tone, of course, I agree with that. I don't agree at all with using hateful language and all that kind of stuff. Please don't misunderstand me. But I do think that in the church, you asked about Scotland, in the church, we toned things down so much, we became completely tone deaf to what was going on. And sometimes someone somewhere has to speak up. And in the Western world at the moment, it's largely gay atheists like Douglas Murray or people like Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson, none of whom are professing Christians who are, are making that stance. And I have to say that as a, as a Christian, I find that somewhat embarrassing. And I wish that our own leaders would be a bit more forthright. But anyway. Well, we're out of time, but would you please join me in thanking David for sharing uh, so freely.